Perry, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Angela, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Yes, and tell us uh, who you are, what you do, and the, uh, mm. the impact you're looking to make on the world. Mm, thank you. So I'm based right in the centre of uh, of England. Uh, so if you know Birmingham and you know London, I'm kind of in the middle of those two. Mm. Um, I have for the last 10 years been running my own enterprise. So people and transformational HR, PTHR. Um, and uh, the backstory, though, before I did that, I spent uh, six years prior to this working in the nonprofit arena in organisation design, talent, that kind of thing. Prior to that, I worked in the UK civil service, so I worked in the courts and legal system, but I spent most of my time working on projects that were helping modernise, I suppose you'd say, through technology. Uh, but the interesting piece for me was where technology met human beings and the sort of training that's needed to help them do that. So that's how I find, found my way um, into HR. Um, yeah, so I'm from a small town, uh, but with big ambitions and the impact I want to have is throughout my working life, I can only describe as um, a discovery journey, who I am and, and what I'm all about. And I see a lot of people who don't have that. So I think that's unfair. So my mission is to help people find who they are through their work, because I think when you do that, you can achieve a state that's called flourishing. And I've had a very flourishing uh, working career. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Mm, yeah. And you talk a lot about kind of the conditions of the organization to create that result, because mm. um, and I don't know, you know, we can kind of have a conversation around this, mm. but I think a lot of times we put that on the individual, right? Yeah. Like just flourish, just thrive. You can yeah. do it. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so what are some of the things that the organization, I guess, must think about to create mm. those conditions? Mm. So I guess it all starts with the reason the organization exists in the first place. And uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by the concept of purpose and meaning. Um, and let's just say there are some organizations where that's really clear. You might be a social enterprise, you might be looking after children, adult care. Um, and there are lots of other companies who are stacking up profit. And uh, they will say that that's their purpose to, um, I guess, bring more value to their shareholders. I'm like, no, that's your outcome. Mm. But your purpose is to provide a service or something that people want. Right. So I think that's that's the kind of thing that interests me now. People flourishing doesn't just happen if they work for a humanitarian aid organization or through something that seems to have like civic duty attached to it. Um, it can be that you work for a company that makes money, but that actually provides a service that people really, really need. And whether that's in retail or manufacturing or increasingly, I suppose we're seeing in industries sort of growing like technology for good that helps you make more choice and live life with more options. And it might be that it's in things like green and renewable energy, uh, conservation, <laughs> whatever it might be. So I think it's sometimes easier for people to kind of find their connection to that purpose by going, yeah, I believe in that. I believe in social good or I believe in mm -hmm. um, helping the environment. But to a lot of people, they're trying to make ends meet. They're trying to get mm. paychecks that help them live their lives. And they might not see purpose as that entitlement to them. They're like, no, I'm just serving tables or I'm on a production line. But they're part of a team. They're part of something that's got history, perhaps, that's got a future, that they could find who they are and maybe what they started doing isn't what they should be really doing, if that makes sense. And I love the thought that organisations help people kind of discover that. Uh, so they mm. develop, educate, they um, bring people's attention to things like team and camaraderie and uh, ethics and morality and uh, adaptation and versatility, because I think that then opens up a whole kind of spectrum of choice for people. So I think mm. where I see people who don't have that, the choices are just not there. Where I see people who are quite vibrant about their work almost choice is abundant there's almost so much they could do that they're sort of excited and engaged in their work so i love to see organizations that are deliberately developmental that's what i'd say hmm. yeah no, you, you bring up an interesting point and, and what it made me think of was like the the maslow hierarchy of needs in a way mm. right because mm. um you know if you are let's say living in poverty or um you know, you're trying to live paycheck to paycheck, how can you even get to that next yeah. Yeah. tier of mm. uh, belonging or um, camaraderie? So mm. 
Um, so what are some ways, I guess, that organizations can do this in a sustainable way for the organization, but also for the people? For sure, for sure. I mean, absolutely, there are people needed who will do work that means they get dirty or it's kind of mundane or repetitive or whatever it might be. But like people need to do that until we get the kind of level of automation that perhaps is talked about in the future with robots doing things and, and what have you. However, um, that may not be what you do forever. So I think there's something about organizations who can just give people the chance to explore what are they good at? What are they excited by? What what lights them up? What gives them energy? And one of my favorite phrases is by an American, um, and, and he was a professor, uh, Howard Thurman. And he said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what brings you to life and go and do that. Because what the world mm. needs is people who've come to life. And I think it's that. It's almost like you don't have to tolerate or just accept that where you are now is where you will be forever even if you perhaps opted out of education or you're from a poor background or so on because you know, I, I came from a working class background my parents worked in a factory making shoes um i went to school but i didn't go to university but i was lucky in that i had a thirst for knowledge i had a kind of a sense that there was always something exciting for me to do if I just looked and found it. Uh, and, and I was fortunate enough that things happened around me that helped me explore that and kind of craft that. Um, and it, it, in an organisation that can design those kinds of opportunities in for people where they can talk to colleagues in different roles, understand what kind of level of intellect you need or skill you need and how they can acquire that. I think it just gives people this sense like I'm not here forever, but I can do a good job while I'm here. And I know my future might be something over in a different part of, of this organization. So loyalty could come from that. Um, but I think it's just this sense that you are more than you're defined by some kind of job description. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, there's definitely organizational, I think, barriers to what you're saying, because what, what comes to mind for me is this, you know, this concept of, um, you know, I work with a lot of organizations that there's a little bit of talent hoarding, right? It's like, I've yeah. got this person in this role yeah. and they're so good at it. So let me just hold on to them. Let me hold on yeah. tight. Um, so what, what kind of mindset shifts or paradigm mm. shifts do organizations need to engage mm. in or think about differently for this shift mm. to happen? I think the psychology of us will tell you that we are hardwired, I guess, to um, to want to sort of master something, to do really well at something. So whether it's a hobby like playing the guitar or whether it's actually your paid work, we we tend to have this drive that we can't really resist. It's almost like in us to do it really well. So I think there's something about when people have hit that level that they know they can do it really well, they kind of thirst for a bit more, right? So if you try and keep them in that role because they're a good performer, eventually they'll get frustrated. So I think there are a number of options you can do as an organization. You can give them some assignments. You can say, hey, you're really good at this. So what we'd love you to do is perhaps spend a little bit of time helping us improve this process or looking at a way we can serve customers better. Or maybe you could be the kind of person who could onboard new employees, all these things kind of cost very little except effort and, and mm. will. Um, and I think those kind of things help people go, hey, I'm valued because I'm being asked to do something. Now, what you shouldn't do as an organization is take that as just piling more onto people mm, to get yeah. more from them, right? Because you'll just kind of go, oh, hang on a minute, this is not really fair. So I think there's something about the balance that's there, but we tend to like to have that kind of sense that there's more to us than perhaps we've been used to doing, and that might help them discover. I mean, you know, me in the learning and development world, I didn't know I was good at running training courses until I did them. And then I thought, yeah, I really like this. So I ended up working in that sort of area. So so I think there's that, but I think there's a kind of conversation to have with perhaps somebody who's maybe a supervisor or a team leader, where the team leader can just look the person in the eye and kind of go, what are you all about? Tell me all about the things you enjoy and that bring you to life. Mm -hmm. and stuff." Because I think if we have that conversation, the team leader might go, hmm, so you really like complex problem solving and using numbers. Well, we don't have many people on the team that can do that, but I reckon there's some things you can do. So before, mm -hmm. often what happens is you sort of adapt your job. 
And I think from that, you start to be um, a little bit more aware of what you're capable of. And then I think those people who think they're hoarding talent will have to think again about maybe, maybe I should let this person go, but use them to bring the next generation of person into that role so that I have a kind of fresh start. A bit like, I suppose, in, in, in football, where you get the kind of rookies who are taken under the wing by the experienced people, knowing that actually they'll probably take their role eventually, but they kind of do it because it's right for the team. I think there's something nice in that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also a paradigm shift of, uh, you know, this uh, kind of self-serving agenda and climbing the ladder, you know, all of that, that mm. I think we've been taught often in organizations, like, let me look out for myself and achieving my goals yeah. versus it's not your talent, it's our talent. Let's think about yeah. how we mobilize it in the right way. So that's a that's a shift. Totally that. Yeah, totally that. And I think what I've seen in managers who are perhaps a little bit more attuned to that, they recognize that, that, that those people, if they kind of kept them, they would probably diminish their returns mm -hmm. after a while and they'd frustrate them. So I think your best thing is to do find their sort of level, stimulate them as much as possible and eventually let them go maybe. But you could also kind of groom them as your successor. You can kind of bring them into your world and see if they're capable of stepping into that space. Because again, that's what people did for me and it really, really helped me. So I think there's something about general generosity and there's something about spotting potential that as a manager you're like I help that person that's kind of what I'm here to do really I'm I'm not a bureaucrat who manages workload and and reports I've got mm. these people's lives in my hands and actually mm. I'm kind of in service of unleashing their full potential I think there's something really fulfilling as a team lead to do that yeah, I think that's you've just defined leadership in a nutshell. That is <laughs> that is leadership. We have a responsibility to people. Um, and I and I want to ask you a question about mm. something you mentioned a little bit earlier in you know kind of uh, jobs and and where they're going, the automation. What what does that mean for a strategic way to I guess upskill people within organizations mm. as well? Yeah. I mean, I guess, Angela, this is really topical because at the moment the world is gripped by chat GPT and GPT-4 mm. and generative artificial intelligence, right? And I think what we're seeing there is people are using it going, wow, all this like administration that I used to do, I can just kind of ask the machine to write a report for me. Wow. So then people are going, oh, but what does that mean for the people who would normally draft that report? Yeah, mm. that could be uh, something. So I think we thought automation would be robotics and it would be, um, you know, the kind of um, manual and perhaps like mm. I say repetitive work. But it's not just that now. I think it's analytic. It's it's even storytelling. And we're seeing generative AI even produce art and music and stuff. So I think there's something about, yeah, we've got to be alive to this. And I think there is something about the work we do that we're attached to because it kind of shows that we're making a contribution, but that we ought to think, but if I don't have to do that, where else could I go with the kind of things I'm interested in and capable of? So I think in customer service, great example, right? If you're dealing with repetitive query on query, same thing, it's like the bot will do that. Mm. But where it deviates from the norm and it's a really complex problem to solve for somebody, you could spend proper time talking to that person, solving that problem and giving them the kind of concierge, high touch human service that we all crave, right? While the bot is dealing with the simple repetitive stuff. Mm. Now as a person doing the work, that must feel so much more fulfilling because you're getting to know intimately their challenge and help them out. So instead of just going through the mill like 58 times a day, you're dealing with these three, four, five really tricky things that you can help people with. So I think that is where we look at it. It's like we don't have to just offload jobs. We make them more sophisticated, high touch, mm. variable and deal with the complexity because I think that's more rewarding work anyway. Now, as a company, what that can then give you is a kind of an advantage, I suppose, where, you know, you can start to say, hey, look, our bot is so top. It will give you all the kind of base level query you want. But know that when it needs a human, we've got some strong people with real commitment who are going to get you the result. And people kind of go, well, hey, that's my kind of organization. So it should be mm -hmm. a kind of retention tool for customers and for employees. I mean, there are some things where I think technology will strip out a whole range of roles and people go, what does that mean? But I think it gives us a chance to go, but what would you rather do? And then start mm. to think about redeployment for sure. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a, a topic that's been on my mind. And, and I find it kind of ironic, especially in the work that we do. You know, we call some of these skills soft skills for so long. Mm. 
And yeah. now are, they are the hardest and the most exactly. prevalent of skills. <laughs> they so are. I mean, like, if you're a manager, you've probably got a whole administrative series of things you have to do, plus all the people stuff, plus perhaps your own projects. Now, if the administrative burden is removed from you, so you don't even have to manage your own diary, and uh, mm. then you can spend more time with these people and kind of help them develop, and then they can come and take mm. some of the load off you. And then you can kind of think, my projects now, I can really give a good shot. So I think there's even something in it for managers who are probably thinking, does it mean that algorithm is going to take away all the things I do? No, it is going to give you the chance to get to know your people, to really yeah. show what you're there to do, which is just as you say, get the best out of people. Mm. Yeah. And, and the other question that comes to mind is what does that mean for leadership? You know, we're kind of raising the bar almost. And so for people who have kind of skirted by and maybe have been an elevated yeah. individual contributor, yeah, not sure if that's going to work uh, in, no. the, in the future. What a great phrase, elevated individual contributor, because that's what a lot of people have managed to do to get themselves into a higher ranking mm -hmm. position, right, with more power and perhaps clout, when actually I think what we're seeing now, and it came through the pandemic, didn't it? Those leaders who showed up as real human, sensitive, mm -hmm. emotive, wanting to know about what they could do as leaders because they didn't have a playbook, are the ones that people went, wow, I'm really glad actually I saw that side of my leader because I had respect for them as a super technician or a strategist, mm -hmm. but now now I see them compassionate and kind and considerate, but also commercially savvy and responsible mm. and committed. And I think there are a number of leaders um, who are starting to sort of really show up in areas like social problems, climate mm -hmm. change, inclusion issues. And people are kind of going, that's the kind of leader I want, a leader who's kind of in tune with what I'm worried about in the world mm -hmm. and can also help me in the workplace. So, yeah, I, I think there's a more sophisticated and humanist version of leadership that's starting to come through. In your part of the world, actually, one of the people I look to the most in this area is Bob Chapman from Barry Wayman, mm -hmm. who is just the epitome of a leader who goes, I can do the deals, I can do the high kind of strategic vision stuff, but I can also do the human to human, get to know you, understand what is important to you in life. So I think Bob's mm -hmm. the kind of flag waver, if you want, what I think is the next generation of leaders. They're good technicians and they are high individual achievers, but they're also compassionate, caring and really responsible individuals. Yes, yes. I, I think um, all of that is, is really important to, you know, and this is where my brain goes, right? It goes into these different uh, kind of topics and concepts that all connect back, I think, to your point around, uh, you know, how do we create organizational systems that are kind of sustainable, creating mm. this idea of flourishing and thriving for people. For and sure. I think leaders are kind of at the helm of that. They're at, at the, they the, front, the front line of that. They absolutely are. I mean, so I do get to kind of pick up some of the commentary, I suppose you'd say, from the research. So PwC mm. did a big piece on CEOs. The kind of things that keep them awake are things like the, I guess, the kind of sustainability of the organization in two ways. One, in its footprint and environment mm. and, and everything, which is great, but also the sustainability of it as an enterprise, how it looks mm -hmm. after its people, how it looks after its customers and keeps itself in a, a place of relevance, I suppose you'd say. And I think what they're realizing is that it is a complex equation of both spirit and business practice. It's not just being mm. good at products and manufacturing and deals and legalities. It is now, how do you invoke an emotional reaction in people who want to buy from you, work with you and stay with you? And I think that's the kind of thing where we often call it talent. We have to talk about the talent mm. in the organization. That's become so hot, what with, uh, and although they're perhaps not real, but they're sort of phenomena like quiet quitting, great resignation, mm. great reshuffle, whatever you want to call it. Because mm -hmm. I think when I talk to recruiters now, they tell me like hardest yards ever. Like it's really tough to both find the right skills. And then when you get into the conversation with them, to, to make an offer that's good enough for them to come work for you is now really, really tough. And I think there are a lot of leaders going, wow, if I'm not careful, I could I could struggle, not because my product's not good or my capitalization isn't good, but I haven't got the right talent. And I think that's yeah. really nice because it gives us the sense of how do we look after people and make ourselves a great place to be? And I think that's mm -hmm. a positive for all of us. What's your prediction on that um I'll just call it 
a shift in power because I can't think mm-hmm. of a, a better term right now. I don't necessarily like that term, but no. you know, I think that's how people are viewing this um, are. in the market, mm. which I guess, you know, my perspective is that um, we've been seeing it wrong as this like balancing act when we should really be yeah. thinking about it as partnership. But mm-hmm. what's your hypothesis? Do you think that we'll mm-hmm. just kind of go back to the old days and things will be how they are? Or do you think this is permanent? Mm, I, I think it has shifted. Uh, and I think there is um, an attempt to kind of, you know, rebound um, mm. and, and, and kind of just go, hey, that was a blip. But come on, let's get serious now. This is what it's going to be. I'll give you a couple of illustrations of this where people are thinking differently. In the UK recently, there was a trial on a four day working week. So yes. companies mm. were looking at 100 percent productivity. 80% of the time, 100% of the pay. And people were like, that doesn't work. Uh, except for almost all those companies, it did. And, and the reason it did wasn't because the power was then reverted back to the employees from the leaders. The power shifted to a central place where they met each other. And they said, what's best for me in life and for you as a business? Because if I go one way or the other, it'll either be pro you or pro me. And that might not be best for us as a sustainable business. I love that kind of thing where we detach from who holds the power to let's put the power in the middle and work on it together. Right. Literally. And, And I think that's also at the heart of some of the current tension in my country, particularly in the UK, with union unrest and lots of adversarial stances taken against government because government has, you know, without wanting to get overly political, kind of kept things at a kind of level and people are going, mm. oh, that's not sustainable anymore. <laughs> and their objection is to, um, you know, obviously withdraw their labour. When what I think is um, emerging in other places is people going, it's complex. Let's work on it together. Let's let's see what's good balance for you. Great for us. Uh, and actually keep this kind of rhythm between us rather than shift the power too far one way or the other, because you get wage spiral, you get indulgent um, mm. um, uh, sort of treatment. And of course, in the US particularly, I guess, the tech company layoffs is really interesting Mm -hmm. because I see some who have taken the approach, which is really bad. We probably over recruited, but yeah, we've had to let some people go. We're not happy with it. We're trying to do our dignified. And then other people who only know they haven't got a job anymore when they can't log in or they can't use their card to get in the building. It's like, whoa, how undignified is that? Mm. Now that that lives in the memories of the people who are no longer there, but also the people that are there. That's like, pff, I thought we were better than that. Survivor's guilt. Yeah. Completely right. So mm-hmm. I think we're seeing that. Now, Now the power is different there because it, it, it's a kind of grab by the manager, leader, community to kind of go to shareholders that trust us. We can do hard things. Mm. But, but the hard things then <laughs> are the things that people kind of go, I'm not having that. So, <laughs> so I think there's a power struggle there. I don't think that's helpful at all. I think those mm. companies, and Bob did this at Barry Waymiller several years ago, when, when people come together to solve problems, that's absolutely the best way to be. So I think mm. the power is shared, and I think that's absolutely how we'll see success in the future. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, well, you heard it here, everyone. We're going to come back in like a year and see see how things uh, shake up. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, and one of the things that, and this will kind of be kind of, um, you know, our closing, I think, because there's a lot of needles that we've, or thread that we've uh, mm. threaded through this conversation. And mm. the term that you just used, dignity, I think is something that um, spans the individual yeah. Completely. leadership and the organization and Completely. that perspective of how do we create mm. dignity and respect. Yeah, um, totally that. And that's a really tough value to operationalize. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And and as is like virtue, you know, that mm. kind of thing. So, so I do tend to use words like that deliberately, devotion, dignity, mm. virtue, valor, because they, they, they are more noble. They are a detachment from commercialized strategic words. Even empowerment yeah. is a bit like, well, I'm gifting you mm. the power. It's like, oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> should I be grateful? Right. <laughs> but I think a dignified way to deal with it is, how do you want to be with us and, and help us? And how do we need to be to enable you to do that? I think it's just kind of adulting. I think it's a much more mature and sophisticated kind of conversation for people to step in. And, and, and that's not just a white collar thing. That's everybody in an organization. Mm. When you see people who are capable of more and you give them the chance, you will thank yourself as an organization and leadership team by going, wow, I'm really glad I didn't miss out on that because there's so much more 
all we've got to give. So I think you're right. I think the dignity thing comes in very strongly with if we can work with dignity together, we will find out things about each other that we like mm. more and we can leverage and utilise. And that's not manipulative and that's not uh, imbalanced. I think that's a really strong word to kind of keep in mind. But you're right, operationalising it. It's like, so are we having a dignity day? It's like, what? No, <laughs> no we're not having a dignity day. What we're doing is we're, th- we're, we're defining dignity and we're standing by it and we're holding each other to account. And I think, again, it's not a power shift. This is about we all coalesce around that word and we symbolise it and we show it and where it's not there. We, we point it out firmly but with kindness and we kind of go mm-hmm. mm, there was a dignity thing that kind of slipped a bit there and people go, oh yeah absolutely right what do i do to put it right i think there's something where unless you're a real narcissist or a complete psychopath or <laughs> pathologically inclined you want to do right by people who are with you and uh, unless see more of that come through that's the most dignified mm-hmm. thing i think we can do well, Perry, I loved this conversation. Thank you for sharing your brilliance and your insight with us. Where can Appreciate people it. find you if they want to work with you or, or partner mm. up? So I'm on LinkedIn. Obviously, there's only one of me, so that's good. <laughs> and the website is uh, PTHR, so that's papatangohotelromeo.co.uk. Uh, YouTube clips, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, yeah, if you Google search me, I come up. I'm all right to find Perfect. And we'll make sure to include those links in our show notes. People can um, reach out if they're interested. And just thank you. Gratitude uh, for you and, and thankful for, for having you on today. And thank you. And, and, and I'm glad there are people like you that are wanting to give airtime to the right kind of thing. So thank you, Angela. Mm-hmm.